we're recording. <laughs> Everyone, this is Townsend Coleman, Mikey. Yes, uh, yeah, my, Mikey, um, the beloved Mikey, uh, Michelangelo, to those of you who um, perhaps aren't aware of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It was this little thing back in the 80s, but... Uh, <laughs> Real yeah. little. <laughs> yeah. That blew up into a gigantic franchise. Yeah. Tell me about that. Gee whiz. <laughs> how in the world did that happen, eh? Uh, I guess people knew how to uh, respond to the common denominator, and they that's what they went for. I was one of those kids, too, that was in the turtle craze. Yeah. Now, how old, how old were you when turtles came out? Well, I actually... Uh, I wasn't born when it came out. I was born in 91. Right. And um, I got all my brother's hand me down tapes. Right. Because he had grown out of it at the time. And then uh, I constantly was watching it over and over. The tape that I remember watching the most was the attack of the Mac. I think it was the robot that talks like a cowboy. Right. <laughs> it's been so long since I've watched those. Yeah. You and me both. Oh, yeah. And I ran the film out of the tape. That's how much I watched it. Oh, serious? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It ate my VCR ate it because I would rewatch it over and over and over. Yeah, boy, I, I, we don't have to worry about that too much uh, these oh. days, do we? Now we got to worry about DVDs and Blu-ray scratching. Yeah, right. I still use a VCR, so not too or, or mp4s glitching oh that's true now that everything's on the computer yeah i still use physical media do you mm -hmm. you know I, I was one of the lucky ones when i back in the beginning of my career uh i got into radio back in 1974 75 something like that and uh yeah i was just uh, i was 20 and uh, worked in radio for 10 years but this is back when we still played LPs still played vinyl album 45s that kind of stuff so so you know in all our commercials we recorded on quarter inch tape magnetic tape back then <laughs> and uh but I consider myself lucky because I loved working with the old physical media you know I loved playing records I loved queuing them up on the on the turntables and uh you know, hitting the button to start them and, you know, hoping you queued it up just right and hit it just in time to get that music going. Um, and then being able to work in production in the production studio, recording commercials uh, on tape and then having to edit them on tape where you actually take a little grease pencil and you mark the spot where you want to cut it. And then you put it in a splicing block and you got a razor blade and you cut the thing and then tape it together, literally. I'm just grateful that I had that experience and was in the business back in those days, because I remember in the early eighties, after I'd been on the air for about five or six years uh, is when CDs started to come out. And, uh, and I remember thinking, and, and uh, laser discs as well. I remember thinking, wow, this is crazy. It's like, there's no needle, there's no vinyl, there's no, no physical contact to these discs. It's laser. It's crazy to me. And, uh, and then of course those took over by the time I got out of radio, um, vinyl just went and, uh, it was gone almost completely. And same with tape. They started recording on computers and doing their production on computers and stuff. And, uh, so I consider myself lucky, you know, looking back at those old days of being on the radio and being able to experience that visceral, vinyl stuff now now you can just do it all on your phone <laughs> <laughs> that's right it's ridiculous uh, you know i mean i was looking at oh my goodness i was looking at uh one of the the um uh the gopro cameras mm -hmm. uh, this, this 360 one the max and just looking at this thing and just realizing what we can do now with these little devices, this little supercomputer in my pocket, you know, uh, it just blows me away. I mean, I remember back in, in the late 70s and early 80s thinking, I oh, wouldn't it be crazy to have like a video phone. I mean, that'd be just nuts. I could call my parents and my, my kids could talk to their grandfolks and 
they could actually see them while they're talking and stuff. And I remember back in those days, there were people who were predicting that it was going to come. And I was thinking, wow, well, can't come soon enough. This is great. Well, now we <laughs> we got FaceTime, you know, on this thing right here. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and, and look at you and me. I mean, where are you located, Tim? I'm in Arkansas. You're in Arkansas. I'm in L.A. And we're talking like we're next door. I mean, this is this is our video phone. So, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. It's pretty much it's kind of like the Ninja Turtles kind of predicted that it would happen. Um, the turtle comms. <laughs> That's right. With the turtle com. Right. Exactly. Well, dude, yeah. this is my turtle com right here. And when I talk into it, I say, hello, is anybody there? Nobody answers ever. So I stopped talking to it. So all I do now, dude, is I just talk to myself. That's because you need expert advice. That's right. That's right. And I'm the one to give it. I, I'll tell you what. So what do you want to talk about, Timothy? Well, let's talk yeah, about one of the best things ever, the Ninja Turtles. All right. I, I'm, I'm up for that. What was it like voicing Mikey? Oh, man. It was a blast. I, I mean, how could it not be? You know, I was I was very fortunate. I moved out here to L.A. from Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, where I was on the radio uh, in 1984 um, with the idea that I wanted to be on camera. I wanted to be an on camera actor. So um, I had done a lot of stage work and, and uh, musicals and modeling and TV and radio and just about everything I could think to do in Cleveland. And so when I came out here, I wanted to be in, you know, a TV show or uh, movies, whatever. But uh, my thing was on camera. And but I'd, be, I'd been doing so much voiceover work back in Cleveland that I had a really good demo tape when I came out here. And so uh, I got an agent uh, about two weeks after I moved here and uh, they started uh, sending me out on uh, these voiceover gigs and 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 on camera commercials as well. But the on camera theatrical stuff, the movies and TV shows, uh, was a real tough nut to crack. And I, I frankly didn't really enjoy it that much, uh, the little bit of work that I did get back then. But, uh, but the voiceover stuff really took off. And it was about six months after I moved here in March of 85 that, um, that my agent sent me on an audition for a cartoon series called Inspector Gadget. And so that's, that's how I ended up breaking into animation because that wasn't even on my radar back then. But I got this little part on the uh, last 10 episodes of Inspector Gadget. And so that uh, got me into cartoons. And I you know, started auditioning more for that stuff and was booking series. So by the time Ninja Turtles came along, uh, I already had a, a, a couple of cool series under my belt, was working on Fraggle Rock at the time. My good buddy Gobo right there. Oh, Wembley, you rock dust allergies all in your head. <laughs> I remember yeah, that we're show. We're going to go exploring in outer space with my uncle traveling, Matt. Yeah. Uh, anywho, so, uh, so, so Rob Paulson and I were working on Fraggle Rock together. And uh, the, the voice director of Fraggle Rock came in and uh, said one day he was going to be uh, casting and directing this new series. And he pulls out a, an, a, an issue of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comic out of his brief, briefcase. And we looked at it. And just shook our heads. And I thought, man, good luck with that. That's kind of a weird title. You know, this is back in the days when, when things were very, uh, very much vanilla, uh, I'll say. You know, Strawberry Shortcake, My Little Pony, you know, shows mm -hmm. like that. But, um, but he brought us in to audition for it, and we, we got parts on it. And, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. You know, we, we went into our first session, and... And, uh, you know, started laying down the lines and did those first five episodes, which was the pilot uh, for the series. And, uh, and we just we just had a ball. I mean, it was, uh, you know, we, we were already friends, Cam Clark and and uh, uh, Rob Paulson and I and uh, Pat Fraley and these guys. Uh, we had known each other just from, you know, doing animation together and, and doing voiceover and seeing each other at studios and stuff. So it was like, you know, getting together with some of your best friends and just making this loony show and uh, trying to bring these characters to life. And 
you know, just hoping against hope after those first five episodes that when they aired in the, in the fall or late fall of, of uh, that year of 87, that, um, that this thing would, you know, maybe spark some interest and, and uh, actually go to air and get picked up. And we were lucky it did get picked up. And, you know, then after it started airing on a regular basis, that's when it really started developing a, an audience. But, but, you know, Tim, I mean, back in those days, we had no idea that it was going to blow up the way it did. Uh, oh, yeah. We didn't know if we were going to get a second season out of it or a third season, you know, but by that time we could tell, okay, so by 88, 89, you know, going into 90, this thing was, it was a real juggernaut at that point. And we realized we were onto something, something huge. And, uh, and so it was a great privilege, you know, but this is back before the internet. Um, so we didn't know what sort of fans we had out there. We would occasionally get a little fan mail that was sent to the producers and they'd bring it to recording sessions for us to see. Um, but other than that, you know, it wasn't unless we ran into people and, you know, they said, so what do you do? And you say, well, I do cartoon voices. What? What kind? You know, well, I do this show called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. What? You do? <laughs> what do you do on it? Well, I'm the voice of Michelangelo. What? <laughs> it's even it's even crazier. And so, so back in those days, you know, pre-internet and pre-comic cons and all that kind of stuff, uh, we just, we just kind of had no idea how big the show was. We were just hoping the ratings were good enough that we get another season out of it, you know. So, yeah, and it, it was huge. <laughs> it was huge, and we just we didn't know how huge back then. And sort of toward the end of it, uh, in I want to say two thousand like 2006, 2007, along in there, you know, the internet had come along by that point. People were on AOL and were, you know, talking about cartoons and stuff. And so there was becoming at that point an awareness of this thing called voiceover and voice actors and, you know, getting into the, you know, sort of, um, I, I want to say, what did I say? Did I say 2007? I didn't mean 2000, 1997. Is yeah, 97. I, 97. So, yeah. And so, you know, by that point, the, you know, the internet was sort of well on its way. Um, but then certainly into, into the 2000s, you know, is when this thing of voiceover kind of became a thing and people were aware of it. And, you know, we, we started having websites and, and, and then social media started coming along and, you know, once that happened, then it's like the cat was out of the bag and then people were aware of us who did what we did. But prior to that, it was, we were just a very sort of small kind of quiet community um, here in LA. You know, you had to be here in LA in order to do uh, animation cartoons. Um, you know, unless you happen to be one of the lucky Canadians who was getting work up in Montreal or, or um, Toronto um, you know, but, uh, yeah, those were, those were fun, heady days. Uh, you know, a, lo a lot of work, you know, I was relatively new in town. Most of us were, you know, and, uh, you know, and so we just happened to be in the right place at the right time and, and, and magic happened and lightning struck. And <laughs> here we are all these years later and this thing called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is still a thing. You know, so I'm, I'm great. I'm awfully grateful for that. And certainly grateful for all the years of great fun that I've had with my compadres. I can, I compare the turtles to Disney. It's like something that's just not going to die out. <laughs> well, I, I, Tim, I think that probably is a fairly decent comparison. Um, and I agree with you. I think there's, I think there's a, a snowball's chance in, in Hades that, uh, th that turtles is going away anytime soon. I, I, it's just, uh, you know, I mean, it was a juggernaut back in the early nineties. It's way more of a juggernaut now, you know, just in all the merchandising and all the various series that have been on and the various movies that have come out and, and all of that stuff. But it's a privilege to be able to sit here and, and, and talk with you and talk to fans and stuff. And, and, and to look back and realize, you know, after all these years, the, the the coolness has not worn off for any of us you know we love still going to comic cons when there's not a pandemic you know yeah. in my backyard <laughs> but meeting fans and and uh, talking to you folks so thanks for having me on today oh 
uh, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Of course, man. Yeah. So uh, did you ever do any, uh, you know, fill in for other characters on the Turtles that, you know, couldn't come in? Or did you ever like line read for Krang? Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, that, I guess, was a, a, a bit of a, a mistake. <laughs> trying trying to mimic Pat Fraley doing his Krang, uh, which I couldn't do. Yeah, I did. I, 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 I filled in for, uh, for James Avery as Shredder on a couple episodes and for uh, uh, Pat uh, as uh, Krang and, and Pete Renaday as Splinter. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you, honestly, Tim, the, the way that those things came about was was a bit misleading back then because uh, there would be times, this is when James Avery got the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And so there were times when he couldn't make it to a recording session. Uh, so they would have one of us and and often they would have me just dummy in the lines. Well, back in those days, my assumption was that I was just doing that, dummying in the lines. And that once the animation was, because see the way that we do it, we record our our lines, our scripts first, and then they animate to our voices. Okay. So we, we're not like looking at animation on the TV screen and trying to match the lip flap. We do our dialogue first. That's the very beginning of the process. And then our voice tracks are sent to wherever the animation's being done, whether it's in Korea or Ireland or, you know, uh, Garden Grove, I, where, <laughs> wherever it is. And, uh, and then they animate to our voices. Well, back in those days, uh, if somebody couldn't make it to a session, um, oftentimes I would just do their lines. It's just my sense of it was for timing, but not really as much for performance because they, my assumption was they were going to get the actual actor, whether it was Pat or, or James or, or Pete, um, to, to come and do what they call ADR. Uh, it's, uh, uh, automated dialogue replacement um, where they would come in and then they would actually do their lines looking at the finished animation. Well, that didn't happen. And, and so my poor renditions of these great characters <laughs> um, and these great character actors um, ended up on the air and uh, it was surprising and um, frustrating um, certainly for me, but more so for the actors, you know, it's like Pat Fraley seeing, you know, the Krang and this horrible, you know, attempted mimic of his, of his performance, um, by me, it just should never have been like that, you know, but, <laughs> but there were things done back in those days that, that probably wouldn't be done that way today, you know, and, uh, I think we're a lot more aware of that, but, uh, <laughs> Now, now with Pete Renaday, Pete actually did get sick at one point and and was in the hospital for for a spell, and uh, and I did um, with his blessing uh, fill in for him uh, doing Splinter, but um, but yeah, that that was sort of a that was sort of a weird kind of controversial time, and and when I see you know people put my name in the credits as voice of Shredder or voice of Krang or splinter or th those things it just makes my skin crawl because that is so that is so not that is so not the way it was supposed to be and uh so anyway enough of that you understand what i'm saying yeah uh do you remember a videotape an old videotape called operation blue line yes that was that was the thing we did for the local bus authority or um or the metro uh, yeah, the trains here in LA, right? You know what yeah. you're talking about? Yeah. I, I still have that tape. <laughs> <laughs> Do you really? Oh my gosh. I, I have it. Um, I actually found it at a thrift store. Well, my brother found it and he bought it and we would just constantly watch it 10 minutes of that just for the heck of it. That's hilarious. Yeah. I, somebody sent me a link to that on, on, I think YouTube uh, not too long ago and said, you remember this? And I, and I looked at it and I was like, Holy cow. Wow. Some of the stuff that's out there, I've completely forgotten about, you know, but I'll be honest with you, Tim, of the almost 200 episodes that we did of turtles. Um, I've only seen, I've only actually watched just a handful of them. I've never seen the whole series. I've never watched the whole series. 
you know, so when fans like at Comic Cons come up and say, so, you know, what's your favorite episode? And I'm like, mm. <laughs> I don't know because I haven't seen most of it and I don't remember recording most of them, you know, because that's, that's all, that's all, that's a lot of episodes over 10 years. And, uh, you know, so, so yeah. So when I saw that, uh, operation blue line, it was like, Oh, that's right. It's like when people have reminded me of, uh, doing a cartoon all-stars to the rescue. And I don't oh, know yeah. if you ever, ever saw I, that, but I own the tape to that too. You got the tape to that out. Right. And you it's still got a v- tape, hand me down. <laughs> and you still got a VHS VCR, right, Tim? Yes, I do. Yeah. Good for you, man. You know, listen, I've got like nine of them, so it's nothing, I, nothing wrong with that. I just bought a VCR the other day. <laughs> Did you really? A VHS? I a, yep. I found it at a thrift store and the lady only wanted $7 for it. I'm like, I have to have it. I've got some tapes I want to transfer. <laughs> no way. Oh, so you didn't have one before that? No, I did, but it kept eating the tapes, unfortunately. Which is not a good thing because when they eat the tapes these days, most people wouldn't know what to do, wouldn't know how to repair the thing. So I, I tried to unscrew it and clean it out and everything. It didn't work. Yeah. Right. So does your, uh, does your new $7 machine work? Okay. Oh, it works great. How about that? That's awesome, dude. I just actually uh, transferred operation blue line to DVD. So <laughs> as it should be, I have a bunch of old commercials and stuff all recorded off TV you know, and it was back during the air dates when they aired the turtles. Well, it's my brother's tape, actually. So I just running them off to DVD. So um, I found the USA Express tapes that uh, he had taped off and I ran them off. And there were some commercial bumpers that you guys actually did for USA Express. What's USA Express? Um, I think that was the channel that ran the turtles. I'm not sure. I know that it was. Either. Oh, okay. That probably, yeah, that probably had to be like in syndication and reruns. Yeah, and it was. Stuff, uh, I would think. Yeah. Okay. But it actually had you guys uh, do some of the voice work. I think it definitely showed Mikey on the bus a couple of times or on the train. It was on a train right? a few times. And, and I was sitting there running that off and I'm like, you know, I'm going to talk about this when, when I interview you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, anyway, what was it like voicing the tick? Uh, again, it was just a great honor and just huge fun. Um, I would have to say, actually, that probably recording the tick was was my my was my favorite uh, time in animation. Not that I didn't love the turtles. I I I did and still do. Um, but there was just the tick was just such a different show and the scripts were so well written. And when I got that part, I was like, Oh yes, thank you. Thank you. This is such a riot. And, uh, and I had a blast recording those was bummed that it only went three seasons, you know, but, uh, evil doers beware you face the tick. As a matter of fact, I will share with you one of my prized possessions right here. This right here is the wild blue hero. And if I push this little button on his back, you hear me saying, and, or, how about that? There you go. You know what they forgot to put on there? Spoon. Let me see if we can get to it. That's the problem with this thing. It's just random. It'll get there. Stop it. You said that already. That too. Stop. No. No. Okay. I'm going to give you one more chance. There, yes, finally. <laughs> that's like, the, boy, that was a close one, huh? <laughs> that's the greatest oh hero catchphrase God. ever. Well, it, it's great. It's great. It is spoon, indeed, spoon, indeed. And but I have I, to, I have to hold this guy carefully because his butt falls off. 
<laughs> it does. It cracked right along the sides. And so the butt falls off and then his legs fall off. And then it's just his discolored torso and all the humiliation a superhero could ask for. All right. Let's put you back where you belong, my friend. You know, Very it's cool. actually a shame that the show didn't get a DVD release yet. Well, it did, uh, but only two of the three seasons. That was the problem. What did you think yeah. of the remake, the live action remake with, oh, I can't remember his name. Patrick Warburton? Remember. Yes, Patrick Warburton. I thought that was great. You're talking about the first live action one because you know there were two. Yeah, I'm talking about the first one with uh, Patrick Warburton. Right. Yeah. I thought that was very clever and, and, and very cool too. It was bummed to see that not continue past like nine or 10 episodes, but, um, but yeah. And then there was this one just a couple of years ago on Amazon prime that I, uh, I, that I did have the, the great honor of being a part of that one too. So I was the voice of midnight the, the, um, the, he's a black German shepherd who is an author and I got to voice midnight, the dog. Oh, that's awesome. Yes, it was awesome. And I think I think in the Tick uh, cartoon, it did reunite you with your turtle brethren, too. <laughs> uh, wait, say that again? What? I said, oh, I think yes. in the... So, right, you mean working with Robin and Cam? Yep. Yeah, was Barry sure. not in it? Barry, Barry we, ne we never got a, a chance to get Barry on the show. Aww. But, uh, yeah, of course, Rob came in for uh, seasons two and three as uh, the voice of Arthur and many other incidental characters. And uh, and Cam, of course, was Deflator Mouse. So, yeah, it was, it was a blast working with those guys. Oh, uh, yeah. it's on, on I could hear the chemistry in your voices when you guys all work together. Yes. Yeah. It's like when, that, when you came back for the reunion in uh, the 2012 series, I thought that was great. Uh, yeah, it was a blast. And the cool thing, you know, about that was, of course, that Rob was the voice of Donatello on that show. So, you know, he had a crack at doing two of the turtles. Um, and I, and I think he's still gunning for the other two at some point down the road. So, um, when it, when he gets to Michelangelo, I'll just have to give him a few pointers. Won't I? Uh, did, uh, did you ever give Robbie or Greg any pointer, any pointers about playing Mikey? No, Robbie Wrist. Yeah, is that what you or Greg? Who Greg? Uh, I can't remember. Greg, uh, Greg Sipes. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, of course not. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't dream of giving anybody pointers to do anything. It's like no, you you're an actor. You make it up yourself. You know. So I mean, they never asked you about uh, no. how you. Of course, no. Of course not. Um, in fact, I didn't even I, I'd never even met Greg Sipes until I think when we got in to do those uh, crossover episodes on the 2012 series. Um, and but I but I had known Robbie Rist. I had known Robbie for uh, quite a few years. Uh, so I was thrilled to see that he got that, you know, but, I'll, but but I'll be honest with you, Tim, back in those days when they did those first uh, three movies back in the early 90s. When we heard about the first one coming out, we honestly thought that they were going to use us to do the voices. We just assumed that they would, because at that point, there was no, there wasn't any other Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle stuff on the air anywhere. And, uh, and we had been on the air for, I want to say three, three seasons or so by the time that be, first movie, three or four seasons, four. three or four. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and so when we when we read in the trades that they were coming out with a an, a live action version, we figured well they're going to have to somehow put people in suits and they're going to need voices. They'll they'll be using us because we are the Ninja Turtles, right? Have been for right. three or four years. And then and then the closer it got to the release date of the thing, we weren't hearing anything, <laughs> none of us. And so we asked our our agents about it, and our agents sort of collectively got together and and. Uh, contacted the production company, tried to see what the deal was and found out that uh, they had no interest in using us. They were going to go in a completely different direction, um, which surprised us at the time because we didn't know what this new Ninja Turtles um, feature was going to look like. But then when we saw it, it made sense that they didn't use us. Uh, it was a very different look and a very different feel, you know, with the whole live action thing. Um, so I was thrilled for the guys that got it. 
you know, I'll tell you the thing that did bug me back in those days was not that so much, but when they did commercials because the toy company, uh, Playmates Toys, was running commercials out the wazoo for uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles action figures and toys. Mm -hmm. And and they were making commercials like crazy, running commercials on Saturday morning TV all the time and, and you know, after school TV for the kids. And many, many times, I want to say most of the time, when they would have one of our characters say something in the commercials, they wouldn't use us. They would use non-union actors just to try and save money. And, and, and that, that was always frustrating and annoying for sure. I noticed that when I was a kid, the biggest <laughs> noticeable thing was Shredder's voice. It was like, that sounds nothing like James Avery. <laughs> right. Right. And what's so funny is it's like you noticed it and who knows how many other thousands of kids noticed it as well. But the toy companies, they didn't care. They just wanted to, you know, save money and mm -hmm. it didn't make any difference to them. As long as kids knew that it was Ninja Turtles, it didn't matter whether it really sounded like us or not, you know, it's but, like sell the toys. Let's do it. Right. Right. Exactly. So. So uh, is that why you guys didn't get to come back for the 2003 Turtles uh, crossover reunion? Mm, probably now understand that we never talked to any of those people about that. So, so that that reunion, quote unquote, that you're talking about, is that the um, Turtles Forever? I think that's what it's movie, called. Movie that you're, you're talking about. Yeah. And where they actually had an 80s version of the Turtles in it and then each of the other ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they hired actors to to mimic us, to rip us off, basically. And uh, and uh, we never talked to them. They never talked to us. The only thing that we can figure is that they were a non-union outfit and didn't want to pay union scale, even though we were at union scale minimum. It wouldn't have broken the bank um, to have the real guys on there. But uh, but yeah, we just never heard from them. And uh, then this thing came out and people were asking, well, why, why aren't you guys on it? Or when did you guys do that? Cause people, in some cases, people were fooled into thinking it was the real guys, you know? So. When I watched it, it, the one who did Raphael's mimic, it sounded just like Rob. So I was yeah. kind of fooled, but yeah. <laughs> Mikey and Leonardo and Donnie didn't sound anything like you guys. Right. Especially. So especially Leonardo, he did not sound anything like Cam. Yeah. Well, so there you go. I mean, you know, there you have it. And again, kids notice that stuff and they care. They do care. They care about quality. They care about continuity. They care about consistency. They, they want to hear the guys that they're familiar with, unless mm -hmm. it's a completely different series, you know, which all the series after ours, were you know they all had their own flavor it still do you know um wh whichever series happens to be on the air now but um if there is one i don't even know if there i is think one there right it, there's a new one out already now the is 2012 it? just ended now they got a new one going well they did it is called um rise of the tmnt and i i don't know if they're still doing that or not maybe they are um i'm i'm so removed from all that you know so, I mean, so it was fine, you know, when they did all these different versions of the series, you don't expect the characters to sound the same. You know, they all have their own flavor and their own sound, their own feel. But when they did that one, the one that you're talking about, the Turtles Forever, where they actually had us, you know, the 80s version, and then guys trying to sound like us, it's like, dude, well, just get the real guys for this. If, that, if that's what you're trying to do and make this, uh, a true like reunion thing it's like come on don't, i don't, don't think cheat, you would have wanted to be here. part of that reunion to be honest because well the way they treated the 80s turtles in that little reunion they made them all seem like oh well your show sucked the 2003 is better that's how they did while the 2012 reunion treated you guys like respectable in my opinion oh t totally you know they they yeah i mean well, and, and that's that was for a reason, too. You know, Cyril Nielli and, and uh, Brandon Amon, these these guys who were writing and producing that show, um, they were big fans of the Turtles when they were kids, the original one, our, our show, you know. So so when they brought it back, they they wanted to do it right. And they they wanted to do it with respect. Like you just said, it was respectful. And 
and and fun. You know, it was very inventive. And the way they had, you know, Rob talking to himself as the original Raphael and the the you know current or the more current Donatello was mm-hmm. hilarious. You know, so yeah. I love meta jokes, so that worked. <laughs> right. And and so that was that was huge fun to work on. Uh, those couple of episodes that we did the the crossover um, uh, trans dimensional trans dimensional turtles I think is what they were called. Personally, I think that was a perfect crossover in my opinion because both sides you got to go to both worlds. Everything was treated decently and excellent. It felt like I was watching the turtles still, and it was continuing on. You know, because I'm an older fan looking at a kids cartoon. <laughs> yeah. So. I'm like, yeah, this is so much better. I'm glad I paid for this. Yeah, right. The 2003 one just angered me, like, badly. <laughs> the, well, <laughs> as it should. There's a review. It should actually, anger everybody. There's yeah. a reviewer who actually nails it. Um, his name's Phelous. He's one of the biggest turtle fans in the world. And he, his what's, review. What's his two, name? Phelous. All right. Um, he's he's done several turtle vi- videos. Um, the way he talks about the Turtles Forever reunion, he he actually says what I'm thinking through the whole thing. I'll send you a link to it. Okay. And he says that it's just completely disrespectful and everything for any turtle fans. He says these are not the turtles from the '80s. This is the Turtles Three Turtles. Yay. So yeah, he gets it perfect. Go Phelous. Yeah, yeah. I'll send you a link to his videos. I'll probably right. tag him in this video when I upload it. All right. Okay. I'm dropping names, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I have to anyway, jot that down. Write that down. Anyway, I got to say, thank you so much for coming on to the show. I appreciate it. Of course. Of course, man. It's a pleasure. And and uh, your messages have always been uh, sweet and uh and respectful too, so which I appreciate, um, you know, from fans. Um, but yeah, so thanks for thanks for being a fan, man. Because I mean, without you, and 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 all the fans out there f- over the the last three decades, my goodness, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had a show, you know. We wouldn't have the the thing wouldn't have gone as long as it did, and and it wouldn't be the juggernaut that it is now without without fans, you know. So. So thank you, man, for for discovering it.